Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, ex-Scotland international and adopted Frenchman, Johnny BT. And who else have we got with us today, Johnny? Do you want to do the honours? You know him very well indeed. We've got the man. We've got the man. Uh, one of my best and oldest mates in France. Oldest? Uh, as in spent the most time together. Oh, okay. That's all right. Then. <laughs> as in not calling him old, Tim, that would just be rude. Um, yeah, one of my best mates, good mates, uh, played together at Bayonne, Peter Jan van Lil, also known as Boff van Lil. He will be playing against the Frenchies in a couple of days for Namibia. So pumped to have him. Welcome, Poff. How you doing? Thank you very much. Good in you guys. We're good. So we're calling you Poff, first of all. Yeah, it's fine. That's fine. And second of all, Johnny mentioned oldest in his intro. He wriggled out a bit there, but we did have a chat a few days ago and Johnny was like, Poff's the oldest player to ever play in a World Cup. I said, no, Johnny, that's not right. You can't do him dirty like that. Diego Ormachea played for Uruguay at the age of 40. So yeah. you're not the oldest player ever at a World Cup. That's wrong, Johnny. Out of order. You know, Johnny makes up stuff all the time, so it's normal. <laughs> if you listen back, I said oldest player to pay, play for Namibia. And that is true. oldest for this World Cup. So yes, how does it feel? In all seriousness, obviously we can have a laugh and a joke, but when the media trots out that Johnny says it in commentary, the oldest player in the world is that something you're proud of? Yes, Poff. Tell uh, us how does it feel to be this old? How does it feel? <laughs> Mate, you're the same age as me. How do you feel? This is not true. <laughs> I am much younger than you, oh, that's and true. I have been retired for a long time, which shows how impressive what you're doing actually is. So how does it feel, seriously? Well, in my mind, it's still white noise, so I don't hear a lot. If you think too much about getting older, not being able to keep up or everything, then you can stop. In my mind, it's still white noise, so I don't figure it out yet. But uh, in all honesty, yeah, it's good. It is more um, funny than it's an honor, if you understand what I mean. Um, I don't see it as an honor or anything. Um, yeah, but sometimes I can see the difference between me and the younger lads. Otherwise, all good. So you're still feeling good. We mentioned Diego Ormachea. Are we going to see you in four years' time, break his record? Well, Johnny or me? Well, Johnny, De definitely not me. <laughs> no, no, I'm finished. Definitely, I'm finished. This will be the last one. We'll come on to Poff and his journey in a minute, Johnny. But talk us through your weekend. You were lining it up last week. You've been all over the place. And you did see the family briefly as well. I may I a little bit struggling to piece together the days where I actually have been. I feel like I've done another French tour of the whole of the country. Um, last week I was in Lille. I'm fairly sure I was in Lille definitely for France against Uruguay. Then we went to Nantes for Ireland against Tonga. The morning after that game, I got the train down to Bordeaux um, to see Jen and the kids, where we watched South Africa against Romania, which is a classic, really tight game. Uh, then after the game, they dropped me at the airport and I flew to Marseille. We were filming in Marseille yesterday and I'm still here today and going to see Poffy, hopefully tomorrow, for a coffee. Not a beer this time, Poff, maybe after the game. And then going to watch Poff's game on Thursday night as they take on the Frenchies. So it's been a hectic week. Um but it's been epic here, there, everywhere. Um, loving it. Looking forward to a few days downtime next week, um, which is nearly around the corner, but it's been very cool. I'm exhausted just listening. And how was the reception from the family? Were they okay? So you for a few hours and then you made them drop you off right at the airport as if you're the one having it tough. I mean, in my mind, I was like, it'll be really nice to go. I mean, it was nice to see them, obviously, but <laughs> it'd be really nice to go to a game and to catch up. So like my train left non at half seven. I got into Bordeaux half 12 they picked me straight up we went to the game like going to the game with three small children is like having three worms like on top of your wriggle like it wasn't fun we went for a quick um mcdonald's dinner after the game and then they Massive. dropped me they dropped me straight back at the airport so it was one of those smash and grabs nice to see you no relaxation full family fun for three hours and then that was it they dropped me back at the airport and i flew back to marseille so um it's been messy but it was nice just to touch base check in and um, have a hug with the kids and um, which is pretty cool um but yeah looking forward to a bit more serious time um and things coming down a little bit which will be next week you know johnny wellpoff is he always like this is he a bit calmer back in the day when you were with him no he's always been the same right he didn't change <laughs> <laughs> so he likes moving around you know having coffee talking to people the whole time moving around that's his gig from the start so we know him like that and i'm sure his wife knew before the time as well if she didn't it's hard lines tough yeah. <laughs> tough it up jen you're in for yeah. long haul now you know what you signed up yeah. for all right before we get into some of the rugby 
the path. France is obviously your home. You've been there for about a decade. You've experienced three other World Cups with Namibia as well. Just talk us through the experience of this one in your home country as it is now and how special it's been for you so far. Well, it's been quite good this year. I'm meaning the, all the support, uh, the fanfare around the stadium. Um, it's been really great. Um, we got a bad draw, not team <laughs> games-wise. I mean, travel-wise, we play every six days. So it is a bit tough. All the other teams, as I understood, have a one buy. I think mm-hmm. our buy is after our four games. Enjoy that. <laughs> That'd yeah. be cool. So um, we... We travel a lot and we only have like between games, we only have two games or two days for training, travel again, captains play, travel back two ga- two um, training days. So it's been busy, but as I said, with the fans and everything and the stadiums being packed, it's quite a good experience for all the lads. How does it compare to the other World Cups, Poff? Like you've been to Japan, you've been to New Zealand. Um, Japan is amazing you know the everything just works differently our timing was also a little bit different we had more time off we had we can uh, have a little time with our family and friends that visited us in japan as well at this stage we didn't have time off yet um which is which is tough for some of the boys they want to explore as well we are in a smash and grab at this stage we go into a town we play a game and we get out um yeah, but I feel that it's it's good it's good organization. Everything is good, as you say. the The spirit is there. The, everybody is nice. All the people has been nice to us. Um, so to compare them will be different because it's different cultures, different mm-hmm. everything. But for me, yeah, it's obviously it's nice. As you said, it's my it's my home now. So for me to be here, it's quite good. What about for the single boys? You're saying boys are itching to go out and explore. Huh? They've been cooked yeah. up all that time. They've got one week at the end where they've got nothing. They are going to cut loose, surely. No, but the thing is, we will fly back afterwards. So our um, off week, we don't stay in France. You fly out just after your, as soon as you eliminate it, you fly out the next day or two. So our apparent off week, the boys will be traveling <laughs> back to them. So it's not like the Olympics where like the swimmers finish and they stay around and have a week in the village. Uh, you can stay on your own cost if you want to. Yeah, so, well, that's another matter. We'll, yeah. We might come to that later in costs and the different levels among the teams in the World Cup. All it means now is this game against France is now, if you want to have a week on the smash with the boys, you have to beat France, win your next game, and then you get to hang around for a week. That's what's on the line now. Basically, that is on the line, yeah. So oh, that's our game plan. Win this game, bonus point. Win next game, bonus point. <laughs> then we just have to ask New Zealand to pull a few strings so that we can... Easy. So, yeah. Call a few mates up in New Zealand, that's all. We will come on to some more of the positives in a minute, but I just want to ask you briefly about one of the big stories from your game against New Zealand, obviously Leroy Milan's injury. Yeah. What were you thinking from where you were at the time? And is it true that the prognosis is at least a little bit better than everyone first feared? So, yeah, so it happened just in front of us, um, next to the touchline, also touchline in front of the reserve box. Um yeah, it was quite weak. Actually, I'm a, a bit deaf. So, <laughs> uh, hold on. That's the understatement of the year. A bit deaf. What percentage deaf are you, Poff? And tell us why you're. No, I can hear sixty percent, but I can hear the the lower uh, sounds. So, if you there's apparently there's twenty six sounds, I can hear the fourteen lower sounds. So that's why I can hear you perfectly. But so it's the sound go high. I can't hear it. So like women's voices and stuff. It's perfect. Like, yeah. This is the perfect injury. Perfect. And um, I am. Um, my wife doesn't believe it. So we <laughs> went to another uh, doctor, and uh, that was a female doctor, and she said the same thing. And I'm like, listen here, I have the medical papers. If I can't hear you, it's not because I'm not listening. I can't hear you. There are men listening to this all around the world thinking, oh, Noting. this is an actual condition. Yeah. We can get Taking it. notes. You can get it. <laughs> Just go to the right doctor. You can get it. Anyway, so we heard the pop. And the thing is, and we obviously heard him screaming or shouting, whatever you want to call it. And then we, because the one guy actually saw it happen just before it happened, because he like sat on his own leg going down to tackle. And then it was like a snapping sound. And we we thought it was his ankle because his old ankle was other way, foot was um, pointing the other way and everything. And it was obviously there's not a nice scene, but that was very nice from World Rugby and from the World Cup not to replay the images or anything. It was immediately stopped, and I think that was quite respectful to us, Milan. Um, 
And then, but he was actually, after the game, they already told us he's already out of surgery. So it was quite quick and everything was quick and we chatted to him a little bit and um, I don't have the official diagnosis or what happened, but apparently it is more, uh, there was a fracture more upwards to his, his knee and maybe just a dislocation of his ankle. So it looked, obviously looked terrible, but um, he's in good spirits. We talked to him, um, we sent him a few stuff and the All Blacks visited him, so he's in good spirits. So moving forward, I think he'll be good in a good place. It was a very nice touch by the AB's boys as well to come in and visit him, Anton Leonard Brown, a few others, a signed jersey. They didn't yeah. have to do that. That was a really nice touch. Yeah, definitely. Um, as you know, some of the New Zealand boys there are some of the nicest people you will meet um, off the field. And I think it's a good touch. And I think that's the rugby community that is speaking there as well. Um, they are Obviously, it wasn't necessary for do, them to do that. I think that will also give hope to... Um, the route to just keep on progressing and mentally that helps him as well. Let's talk about your journey now then, because we mentioned you live in France, you've been there for about a decade. Could you ever have imagined when you moved over to France all those years ago that you'd still be there today and playing in a fourth World Cup? In all honesty, I just wanted to come to France for one year, um, explore a little bit, play a little bit of rugby, then I wanted to go home and continue working. Um, but as you get there, you get used to it, you get another contract and it just keeps on rolling. I am sure it's the same with Johnny. He thought he's just going to go into Montpellier and just play a season or two and then go back. And now we're still here. So you get so integrated in the community and you meet nice people, you make friends and when you when you see it's a decade later. But Poff, you've got a bit of an alternate story. Not everyone comes into pro rugby the way you have. So for people that are listening who don't know your story, can you talk us through and this is weird, but like your educational background, what you end up doing for work, the age that you came over to France yeah. and the age that you are now, like how long you've been pro, because it's completely different to the like standard, like me in a country like Scotland, where you went to an academy 17, you started at age 18. Yours is very different. Yeah. So basically after university, I, uh, after school, sorry, um, I took a loan to go and study dentistry in South Africa. And um, how it works with taking out loans, you have to, um, you can pay back after your five years, but you have to actually give in your marks every year for them to give you the money, the bank to give you the money for the next year. And uh, yeah, so I finished my dental degree and I started working to pay off the loan. And when I was well, close to finish paying off the loan, me and my wife were actually on holiday in South Africa. And she said, yeah, maybe we will move to, she wants to live overseas a little bit, explore a little bit. I said, no, <laughs> no problem. I was 30 years old. Um, I will call her agent. And within three months, I was in France. So it was a bit quick. Everything happened quick. Yeah, so I worked as a dentist from 23 to 30, um, playing for Namibia, obviously, and playing amateur on top of that, or uh, competing in competitions like the Curry Cup or Vodacom Cup in South African competitions, but as a Namibian team. And then, yeah, I got a call to come to France and we said, yeah, let's do it for a little while and then we'll see where it goes. So I arrived only here when I was 30 years old. And you've played in the top 14, Pro de Deux and... The National. National. So, and, and so last season, am I right in saying you were playing for your and Johnny's local side? Yeah, the local, Hospital. next to Johnny, next to Johnny, yeah. <laughs> so I've got, I got a couple of questions on this. Yeah. A, how was that? Because Johnny's always telling everyone who wants to listen how tough Pro de Deux is. I can imagine playing at that level, it's tougher. What level is it in terms of the French leagues? And if that is round the corner from Johnny, why on earth is he not playing alongside you? He's the reason I played there. Okay. He called me and said, listen, right, this guys, they want you to come and play, play a little bit. I'm going to be playing as well. I'm going to get Scott Scott <laughs> to play. Hey, 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 hey. No lies, Puff. Come on. Uh, no, just joking. So no, uh, they I because of my dentistry, um, I studied in um, Germany. I did a master's in Germany for the past two years, and I finished in October last year. And obviously, I will not be available for any team from no for, for the first few months. And the November test for Namibia in Europe is also so I won't be available until December. For any pro club and all honesty there's no pro, pro club gonna give you a non-jeff player a contract if you're not there for the first five months 
So I made a decision to come uh, go and play for uh, Cabreton. Um, it was nice. It was nice seeing the how the amateur sides of France work and the respect that I have for these people working every day, going uh, offering the nights and the um, the weekends. But uh, it's tough. If it's really tough to go from a professional environment into a less professional environment, let's say that. What level are they at? What what league are they? I mean, the regional. I, in all honesty, I can't tell you what level it is. <laughs> you don't I, even know. I love it. You don't, right? I don't know either. But that's it. Once you get like past top fourteen, probably do a national. It, it's regional rugby. Like it's split into regions, and the games are local derbies. It, it's complete mayhem. But the actual level of what tier it is, I can tell you. That's the thing. I should be. I, maybe I should be more up into it. I was more focused on just getting or keeping fit, uh, playing guys. And I know it's a bit weird, but it was nice for me giving a little bit back to the rugby community because of all that they offered me because I came so late to France. So it was a, for me as well. I had maybe opportunities to go to other teams as medical jokers, but uh, it's not worthwhile. Mate. So what is your excuse, Johnny? You're still a couple of years younger. Let's get, get involved. I'm not good enough. <laughs> Honestly, I would break physically. I'm an old man and I'm past it. Poff luckily has come into it late. So he's like a spring chicken. Like we're laughing and joking when we were playing together. He was 36 and he was like fresh and I was an absolute mess. So that's the difference. It's nice, I think, to have come in and not had the grind early, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, it must have been really nice. It must have been really nice as well, Poff. Like having that chat with you and Elle when you're on holiday in South Africa, a pipe dream and she's like oh like husband make this happen you actually do make it happen ridiculously three months later but then 10 years later you're still living that dream in the south of france two kids like it's pretty cool it doesn't happen for everyone no it's a, it's a quite a weird story but yeah i i feel that sometimes as i uh, told you previously that you know the rugby life is a, a traveler's traveler's life you know two years here two years there one year there and we were quite fortunate to stay for most of our time, we stayed in the same region in the same town. And I think that is basically for us, that is why we stick along or stick here so long. Because if I think if we have to move every two years so forth, uh, we'd have been finished by now. It was also interesting, Tim, like having Poff come in and you'd have some boys that were pissing and moaning about this or that or this. And he'd be like, these boys have no idea. Like the moaning we do in professional yeah. rugby compared to <clears throat> being a dental surgeon working eight till eight in Namibia or whatever it is, like the ridiculous hours, the grind that normal folk have to do. Like coming as program was a breeze. So it was quite nice to have Poff there, A, to keep us in check, but also for the youngsters, like younger than us, to be like, actually, we're kind of living a dream here, boys. Um, let's not be moaning. Let's go about our business and have fun and enjoy it. That's a lot now in the top 14 as well. If you can remember, sometimes when you play away games, there were some of the boys that will... In my opinion, fake a niggle, not to because they don't want to play. I, was, I don't know if you experience it as well, but sometimes I think like, yeah, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and then I think to myself, they will be, I'll uh, choose my language now correctly. There were people that will give anything to play top 14 or even Prodigy. They will give anything. And yes, some of those boys that just don't take everything for granted. They don't, they don't know how lucky they are to be in situations like that. And I think that is the other thing why I continued playing because I understood from where I came from in the sense of working and being in a situation where I have to work and only train at night to being a professional. So that I knew how lucky I am or were. And that is why I think I continued playing because I wanted the luck to extend a little bit. And that's true of your post-playing career as well, isn't it? You've had to work hard for that. Johnny mentioned you're a qualified dental surgeon. You mentioned you spent a couple of years doing a master's in Germany. Is that that's because you had to do that in order to be able to practice in France, right? Yeah, I can't. I can't practice in France. Um, that is a bit complicated here. Um, but I can, with my degrees, I can practice in other European countries. But in France, I can't now. But the, the idea was to work in France with that. So we're still busy with the equivalence, as I call it, to try and see how we can sort it out. And on the subject of things being a bit harder. Can we talk to you about the lay of the land in world rugby? Because there's a lot of sort of stigma and, and bad press, I guess, around the term tier two. But yeah. as a country, Namibia, and as someone who's been at the coalface with them for 
nearly a couple of decades. Yeah. In terms of the way countries like Namibia are treated, is it unfair? Or I guess what would you like to see be done differently? Well, it's not just Namibia, but obviously tier two nations has definitely, they say everything is everybody should do the same, but I can promise you, even if this World Cup is not the problem of, it's not a fault of world rugby. In fact, the, the liaisons from world rugby, they say they actually had a meeting and say, listen here, what the France gets, everybody should get. It should be from top to bottom, it should be the same. But small stuff do creep in, like you do go to a hotel and they say, listen, yeah, you're here, but you can't check in. And I'm like, well, you can't check in. What do you mean? They say, no, you can check in in an hour and a half or two hours. I can promise you it's not happening to other teams. You know, it's like small stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so the problem with us, I think we're treated the same world rugby-wise, but the small stuff, I mean, like, yeah, traveling, all that stuff, it's a bit different for the smaller teams, I can guarantee you that. What about Puff? We've talked about this before, the games or the number of games that you play and the type of games that you play. So I think everyone's seen performances, you know, from Chile, from Uruguay, and there's a real excitement around the tier two level. But you played something like a live and official test between 2019 and 2023 World Cups, which probably isn't enough. And yeah. we talked often about the fact that maybe you'd get like thrown a last minute test or something organized last minute, but it was never really against the nations that you wanted to play against. So do you reckon there could be a bit more done? We've seen the talk about a, a two tiered version of the autumn nation series with the promotion relegation and widen that way out. Like what would help Namibian rugby and tier two nations to get the level of game time required against tier one countries? Yeah, I think it was 11 with the two world cup games included. I think between the previous West Nine test, we played just the qualifiers and it was with, uh, uh, with African sides. And then we played two or three games, but were two only two tests in South America just before the World Cup against Chile and against Uruguay. And I think we are in the same boat. I think um, all the tier two nations, I'm not sure about the tier two nations in Europe, but I can tell you from the rest of the world, we don't get enough exposure playing against tier one nations. So you can't really progress into a, a top tier if you just keep, I'm not saying the opposition was not good. I'm just saying we play each other the whole time. We never play top nations. We just keep, only time that Namibia or other tier two nations play top sides is at the World Cup. Um, and you can see a model according to me that has worked. If you look at Fiji, where they were in 1999 maybe, and where they are now, and they started in the last eight, maybe 10 years, they started going, they started playing France, they started playing all the other teams, and previously they didn't. Um, I, so I think that is quite a good example of what can be achieved if you play regularly at against top teams. And you mentioned it's not a world rugby issue at this World Cup, obviously, because you are getting some some support. But Johnny mentioned it, with all due respect to Madagascar or Kenya or Burkina Faso, you aren't going to get significantly better to compete with the top nations if you are playing them, and let alone the fact that you might only play nine tests against them between World Cup. So is it a infrastructure thing that, that more money needs to be given to uh, the organizations in Africa to create better tournaments, or how do you fix it? That is, I think that's been a question that's been around since World Cup started. Um, I think the problem probably is we have to play qualifiers. You have to give everybody in Africa the opportunity to be possibly can qualify for the World Cup. And because there's so many countries, so many teams, that takes time. And by the time the qualifiers is over, it's a year before the World Cup. So, and then you basically have to prepare for the World Cup and the other test series has already been in place. So I can't see a simple solution to this. I have actually no idea how you can going to solve this, but maybe giving tier two nations that has qualified for a few times to the World Cup, let them also play in November, play them in a, in a series in uh, Europe, say play against Scotland or play against Ireland or some just for them to to continue playing and developing. And the same thing if there's uh, maybe if a team, say for instance, Scotland has to play next summer, uh, the next summer series in South Africa in June or July, maybe go for a warm-up match against them maybe before you hop over to South Africa. Now, just keep, that is what I would suggest, but as I said, it's not always feasible with all the dates and uh, pro rugby going on. And we do see Namibia at every World Cup 
and you made your debut in 2006. So uh, has there been progress since then? Do you, do you notice a difference, whether it's infrastructure or the setup or just anything, or is it pretty much the same as it was back uh, then in 2006? It, my first test was quite interesting. In fact, I was still studying in South Africa and I got the call from the coach. He said, listen, what are you doing next weekend? And I'm like, no, uh, well, I'm here studying that too much. He said, okay, listen, yeah, uh, we have to go play qualifiers in Tunisia. Um, are you interested? I said, yeah. He said, okay, I will we will send you send us a copy of your passport. We will book your tickets. You will get the rest of the team in Johannesburg and we will fly to Tunis. So that is basically how I got involved. And so as I said, that was quite in the beginning. And now it's everything is structured. So you first have groups that is contacted, you have the whole process like a professional team our coaching staff is quite good um and quite professional now we have um, some big shots that is now our coaching staff so that is a good thing um so we've definitely progressed a lot since when i started you mentioned a couple of the big shots the big dogs that have come in like alistair kotze being head coach what's he like what's he brought in terms of organization different way of looking at things big yeah, improvement okay. Yeah, obviously, it was a big improvement. He came as professional, as you said, he was the previous coach of South Africa. Um, he had a lot of success with the Stormers. He actually won the 2007 World Cup with Jake White. He was a system coach. Um, so he bring a lot of professionalism to the team. Um, then you have somebody like Matt Proudfoot that was with South Africa in 2019. And he was Eddie's Jones staff with the UK in uh, England. Um, and then we have some local, a, lo a local guy that played with me and now he's coach. He played for Exeter as well, Cassandra Bota, which is yeah. the back line and attack. And then we got uh, Baron Peterson, which is line out. That's, he's with the Lions now in South Africa. And Pine Pina, that is with the Blue Bulls in South Africa. So it's people that are, know what they're doing, professional setups. Um, everything runs smoothly coaching wise and everything is good so that really steps us that gives us also less time to um, worry about off-field stuff because everything is organized rugby ways let's talk about the rugby now then you played against the all blacks you played against them in 2015 and 2019 as well so what's it like playing against them and was it different this time around uh you i prefer playing against the big teams when i get to the world cup it is as a, for Namibian players to play in a test, uh, you will only play them at the World Cup. You will only play New Zealand. You will only play South Africa or France at the World Cup. You will never play them again. So when you get to a World Cup, you want to play the top teams in the world. Um, so for us, it's a good draw because you want to play New Zealand. You want to play France. You know it's going to be tough, but the, you don't go to the World Cup just to say, yeah, I went to the World Cup, get a high five and get out. You want to play against the uh, big teams. You want to experience everything. Um, so playing them three times, I thought three, third time lucky, but not this time. Um, <laughs> as Jack Berger said, I think the ref was against us. So uh, <laughs> the, the I saw his tweet. The ref cost them the game. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Berger, who's a mate of Paul Stucker, and made me laugh as well. I enjoyed it. Mate, what was it like coming on? To the, I know you've played against them before, so you know what it's like, but you actually end up coming on and playing directly against a friend of ours, his brother. So Adam Whitelock, who we played with yeah. at Bayonne, Sam Whitelock, who was equaling Richie McCaw's cap record. So what was it like? I can't remember if you met Sam when we're all together having a coffee in Bayonne when yeah, he came to visit. I'm, I met him a few times. So um, Do you manage to swap jerseys? No, I imagine uh, he was keeping that. <laughs> the special uh, one. No, so we had a few. Uh, we had a chat afterwards, and but then he said Adam was actually in the stands. Um, so it was good. Uh, we, I said we played three times together, and we met him a few times in Bayonne when he was still there. That's and, right. And he's going to uh, Po now, and he said luckily Luke is there as well. So it's a whole big white lock reunion there in Po. It'll be really cool for them. Um. And very cool for Sam as well to finish that way, equaling the cap record. And then he's obviously seen Adam playing for Bayonne. He's got his brother Luke playing yeah. in Poe. He's going to go and join his brother. He's seen exactly what he's walking into. So another man that has seen the way French rugby operates and wants to come over and play, which would be pretty cool for him to finish that way too. Yeah, I think so as well. And I think if he don't get injured or anything and they progress to the quarter semifinals, finals, I think he will have to 
obviously I know you will have the most caps, so that will be on a um, proper single for him as well. And were you able to have a beer with Sam or any of the other All Blacks after the game, or was it straight on to the next one? No, no, usually there's a few beers afterwards, so we just go and chat a little bit and so forth, um, chuck a few beers, but then afterwards, I didn't went into the changing room for a very long time this time because uh, my family were actually at the stadium, and I, which is quite nice of France. They allow us to take our kids on the field. Very uh, cool. Yeah, so I know like previous World Cups, they were quite stingy, not lying people on the field, but here they have no problem whatsoever. So I took my children on the field and we went with the lap all around and I let them tackle me again on the field and um, enjoyed a little bit of time with them. Uh, so I only went in quickly and then we had to go to a mixed uh, um, media zone. So it was really like an in and out, just hi, hello, chuck a beer, go. Um, and then it's moved to the next one. And most people will want to know, you've done it three times now, what it's like to face the hacker so we've seen teams do different stuff before in opposition to the hacker i guess as namibia you, you don't want to give them any extra reason to <laughs> to give you an absolute hiding but is it tempting you when you get that one opportunity that might never come around again is it is it tempting to kind of do something in response no not really nothing with my personality not um, I just Poff can't hear half the thing anyway. He, it's one of those high pitched noises that doesn't come in, so he's happy. He's just watching the images, taking I all can, in. I can see my vision is 2020, so that's good. Perfect. Um, yeah. So no, no, it is. It's quite. It's quite nice seeing it up front and facing it. Um, and I think from an Amabian side, we're just res- respectful for that. Um, uh, so, it's a, well, it's a funny story to me, but I faced of Namibia has faced. I think. Since I played all the Akas in the world, where I think 2011 we faced Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga, and we faced the All Blacks, and uh, <laughs> we faced Madagascar twice, and they also have a Haka. The they Maki. have a cool Haka. Yeah, the Maki. <laughs> so that's why I say we. I faced all the Akas. So you're the only ones, I guess, to have faced every Haka. I don't know. I'm the oldest man in the world. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> you're a Buddha. I, meant, you're a, I, meant, you're I a really Buddha. kind of meant as a Namibian, like as in not, the All Blacks ain't playing Madagascar, are they? So, no. So, yeah, I think there's a, a few. Uh, the coach, actually, that's our backline coach. He should have faced all because he also played all of those games. So, uh, maybe he didn't play 2000. No, he played all of the games. So, he had faced him. I think me and him, we faced all the hackers in the world. So, what's tougher to face then, the All Blacks or the Madagascan hacker? The game or the hacker? The hacker, just the hacker. <laughs> Putting me on the spot here. I will go with New Zealand. Al, it's nice. See, the, the thing is with the New Zealand hacker, it's just not the hacker itself. It is the respect that everybody in the stadium gives as well. You know, usually when you, if you watch a New Zealand game, there will be some crowds that will boo, some crowds that will sing a song or whatever. But when a movie plays against him, it's always overseas, also at the World Cup. So the people are respectful in the stadium as well. In Toulouse, you could hear a pin drop before they started. Nobody made a sound. And that's impressive. That's a sign of respect. And we gave that respect to um, New Zealand as well by just facing them, having our respect at the 10 meter, uh, meter line. And so that's quite a good experience. And the fact is, my daughter actually told me just before the game that they learned about the Aka in the French school. And I said, oh, well, you will be able to see it. So hopefully she will have a memory to go and tell her friends as well. Aside from the hacker and Jack Berger saying the ref ruined it for you, how did it go? Because you obviously, comparing to 2015 and 2019, you'd have had a game plan and what you guys wanted to kind of achieve. How did it go? Well, uh, the game plan that we had, they dismantled our progress to get into the 22 Afterwards, I told Matt Proudfoot what they decided to do to avoid us getting momentum. Um, they are very good in small, sneaky things that you don't always pick up. And that sneaky things is what turns it in their favor. Like you can't get them all um, going. And I don't know if it is uh, just maybe it happened or it actually I was trained. But when you lift somebody and they come, they lift you up just a little bit. So you can't, your feet is like just touching the ground. So they're not lifting the leg. So you can't, you're not involved in the mall. You're in the mall, but you don't, you're not involved. Simple stuff like when they 
defend. They both hit on the ball, so you can't get your shoulders through to get a quick release. One guy always falls on you when they tackle. It's small stuff that is actually making them very, very good, and that is breaking our game plan, and we just didn't have something to, to give back. And the speed in which they do stuff, when there's a turnover, I promise you, we were on, on a scrum, or in a scrum, five meters from the goal line. And we, we said, listen, yeah, now we're going to get the ball back quick. We know we're on a pressure to scrum, and we're just going to we're just gonna give it to him. We're going to go face it, face it, face it, face, it, face it, until we see a small gap, and then we're gone. I got out of the, um, the scrum, and they were already on the 22 to the 10 meter on the other side of the field running with the ball. And I'm like, what, what happened there? But then afterwards, you have to see the video. Our nine knocked the ball, and he got the ball, and they just they moved the ball so quickly that you you can't get you can't keep up. From the different stages and times you played against the ABs, do you think they're improving? I'd be fair to say that Namibia haven't quite caught up, and the ABs are just improving constantly. Like professionalism, the leagues they have, Super Rugby, they keep shifting. Yeah. Whereas Namibia, a couple of times you played against them, but you maybe you didn't even get to throw a punch did you like there was such a uh, gulf well, this time we didn't, uh, pre previous two times we had uh, we were in better position to score actually our i think we had 12 entries into the 22 wow uh, which is not bad i think it's more than france that in the opening game but we could not finish it we couldn't punch that every time they had just had something we will lose the ball or they will take a turnover so it is quite Yes, they are so professional. They do the small stuff. And as you would know, Johnny, it is not always the guys that's flashy and run beautiful rug, uh, rugby that is the best. It's the guys that can repeat the small stuff. Um, and I think that is what makes New Zealand so great. They are so, so good at the small stuff and they don't make small mistakes. They do the same thing over and over and over again. And they do it so good. Uh, we just couldn't give a punch. It's just, yeah, we tried, but we couldn't. Next time, Bof. We get them next time. It was yeah. the rave. It was the rave. He told me afterwards, sorry, mate. It was, I, I was just trying to even it up. But, uh, yeah. you know. Johnny, me and you will have a quick chat about uh, the France Uruguay game in a minute. But give Poff your coaching analysis of what you saw Uruguay do to France, just, just in case. You know, I'm sure he's got better people on the job. But I think there's also something to be said for not going to these games with fear. So like Poff's played against these boys. He's played against all these boys in top 14. He knows he can run over half of them because he's done it for Bayonne. Poff's one of the best ball carriers that I've ever played with. Um, and there's something to be said. You watch that Uruguayan game. They just took the ball, run hard with attitude and with passion. And that sometimes seems simple and straightforward, but it isn't. Sometimes the atmosphere or the stadium or the fact that their hosts can get on top of you. I'm sure they maybe will have their own game plan and what they want to deploy and what they want to try. They couldn't do it against New Zealand, but... Uruguay showed that you can still throw punches against a side that are ranked top five in the world, even if you're tier two or perceived whatever ranking you are, it doesn't matter. Um, so maybe you should take great heart from that because Uruguay made France look completely ordinary, completely yeah. ordinary. And if if Roman Tavfunua Fenua hadn't been, sorry, if he had received what I thought should have been a red card, they would have lost that game. The only two things that kept them in that game was a scrum, and they would have gone down 140 kilos and a line out. That was the otherwise in the game through multi phase, phase play, uh, gain line collisions. Uruguay had more passion, more energy, and out muscled France at the gain line, which I hadn't seen in, in two years. So that would be what I saw. Um, pretty worrying as well when you see the lack of engagement mentally for Fabian Galti in the side. Like, it's like anyone, if you're not, if you don't apply yourself mentally, yeah. You, you can look average. You can look Joe average. It doesn't matter who you're playing. And like Poff and I have seen that. Like we've gone away from home in top 14, Pro Deux, and we've shipped 50 points at teams that we thought would never even get close to you by on. Um, but when mentally your side isn't concentrated, doesn't apply themselves properly, you can fall apart. So that was the passion of Uruguay with a simplistic game plan. There wasn't anything fancy to how they played. Um, and they also kicked and chased really well. There's another thing. Like France were trying to run out more than they normally, but... Uruguay, high balls, making it a scramble, winning 50-50s. was really interesting to watch because ultimately it was what France had done to other sides. Uruguay did to them. And that passion point that Poff will bring because like Torsten van Jarlsvoort as well, who were playing hooker, Dazel, the captain, playing centre, boys that played for Bayon Colomier, um, have also that little bit of ammunition. We're playing against top 14 players who will be 
perceived internally to be better than us, and therefore this is a pride question. And that's what we saw with Uruguay. Guys that were playing with Van, boys that played at Colombia as well, you saw the passion come through, um, and they really took it to them. So I'm um, coming to the game, I hopefully bump into UNL and the kids as well, um, and I'm really looking forward to it because it's a huge occasion, should be great fun, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing if Namibia can fire a few more shots than they managed to get off against the All Blacks. Yeah, definitely. I think so. I hope so. Uh, we are ready. We, as I said, win the with the Uruguay game and the two nations throwing a few punches. I think playing a few games in the World Cup, you have boxes that you have to check. So you see, okay, this was our game plan. It didn't work, but we can check this few boxes so that we can keep for the next game. So obviously there's stuff that needs to work, stuff that doesn't work. And you also have to analyze the games as well. Um, so... Uh, we saw what happened with Uruguay and how they approached the game. And I think that, as you said, if the, if the guys is just mentally, if they're up there, we can definitely feel a few surprises and a few punches. And I don't know if it was always the plan from Fabian Galtier or if Uruguay have really stitched you up by running them close. But you'll have seen the France team sheet for your game and they've come pretty much full noise. So uh, thanks, Uruguay, I guess. Yeah, I saw that. Actually, we just saw that before we had this this uh, moment and I saw uh, this, I think there's two or three guys coming back. Otherwise it is the same team possibly that played against New Zealand opening game. Um, and once again, I don't care if you're the first string or second string player, you want to play at the World Cup, you want to play against the best. So the more the merrier. So we just want, we want to play and we want to play against the best. Um, so it was for us. It's good they can pick whatever team they need to because it's not going to change our game plan. Speaking of game plans, like New Chip Zealand top, huh? Chip and chase. <laughs> Chip and chase. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of game plans, yeah. All Blacks came out pre-game and said they had a anti Antoine Dupont game plan that they were gonna. We didn't really see much, but for you guys, and, and you've played against them all in the top fourteen. Is there anything specific? to try and look after Antoine or is it just you just get on with your game and fire just, the shots that you want? If, if the um, French, they they will obviously take advantage if you if there's a gap around the ruck. Um, they have that one-off runners with the good hands, with the offloads and so forth. Uh, so I don't think you should focus too much on one guy because then as soon as you focus, if you focus on the pond and he plays short ball to somebody else, you're gone as well. So our basically, we just have to give our line integrity, not focus so much on somebody else's job, you know. Um, so we did speak about not him directly. We talked about the different lines that is a possibility because we only got the team now. All the other stuff was already was already done before the game analysis was done beforehand. Um, but we don't have any specific thing counter against him or any specific player now. Have you got any tricks up your sleeve? So I'm looking forward to seeing a bit more of you guys with ball in hand and firing those shots, but is there anything interesting or quirky? You're looking to not chip and chase. You're not going to do a chip and chase, Bob, but anything else that you... Asking, I've been asking them since July if we can... If I can Please. Chip and, chase. and they said if I chip and chase, they will just make the call and I can chip and I can run to the to the changing room. It will be <laughs> so you just keep running. You That's just it. keep running. They just keep running. And you're gone. Um... Yeah, so basically what we had a big discussion the other day between the players and the staff, and we just felt that the thing about ticking the boxes is obviously we'll have here and there, we'll have a special move or a special thing about ticking the boxes is we shouldn't get too many boxes to try and tick. Let's try, stick to the stuff that worked. Even if it worked just for a small while uh, during the uh, all-black game, a small while during the... Um, Italian game. So if we can just mix those and just build on that, um, then I think that we can maybe throw a few punches. It's going to be pretty special for you, mate. Like you mentioned having UNL and the kids in the stadium, the kids being allowed on the field as well. So to have this one as one of your last international games yeah. must be pretty special to have the family there, it be in France, kids on the field afterwards, and then to have it against the French side, it's a pretty special moment for your family. Yeah, definitely. As you would know as well, your children also, they says Libler in front, back, you know. I don't know if they have any Scottish jerseys or anything. Oh, mate, they, they, they refuse now. So Lockie went to one of the warm-up games and he was crying when France lost to Scotland at Murrayfield. I was like, mate, I used to play for... He's like, no, Dad, I don't care. 
yeah. but that, it's just like French French fever and French rugby fever has gone crazy. And our kids are at the age where they're totally swept up in it all. This sort of sense of national pride as well. But then your dad playing in this competition against the French side. So it must be an amazing moment for the family. Yeah, but the thing is, they say like a little blue, and I'm like, yes, we play in blue, but I don't, I know you're <laughs> talking about us. <laughs> um, but I enjoy that. I, I, I like that that they're French as well, and um, I don't know. My boy just wants uh, Jurgens or Buti. He just wants. He just couldn't understand why where's all the rugby balls all of a sudden, because he came on the field and he thought he's gonna nick a few balls and they, <laughs> everything was gone. And he just kept asking, where, where's all the balls? I said, no, somebody come took it away. He said, no, but he's certain somebody in the stands took a few because when they kick it, he watched the ball. They didn't come back on the field. I should get him a ball. I said, I will try, but I know it's impossible, but I will try. No, but it's, I, I think it's great for them. That's one of the reasons I continued playing as well because um, before COVID, our children were so small. They went to the Bayon games, they went to everything, but they can't remember. So um, the, I basically wanted to continue and try to get into this World Cup for the children to experience the World Cup as well, to experience um, what it is to play professional, watch professional rugby that your father can actually, you can see your father. So it's more for them than it is for me or for my wife. Well, obviously, my wife loves it as well, but um, for the children, it's amazing for them. They are they're living life now that is they had two weeks school now two weeks off again following us all around the country so they're loving it and have you played at the Stade de Marseille before as well because the atmosphere is incredible there isn't it no I haven't played there before it's a cauldron it's cool like it's really highly banked and quite often like we didn't get to play the games there in the top 14 because normally Toulon they move a game they normally play Toulouse there to try and get more people in the stadium there's some Champions Cup games that have been played there. Top 14 finals have been played there, but like it's just noise. It's not something that will affect POF too much for reasons we've already discussed, but right. it's just cool. The, the volume of people is banked really high and it's just an amazing atmosphere. So the boys will absolutely love it. It's a great place to play. Actually, it does affect me if there's too much noise because then I can hear nothing at all. Because <laughs> I have to look at the people and I look if I don't know the line on call, but I do know the line on call, but I have to see what they are saying to me. So that's what it came down to, Tim. Like if I was calling line outs at Bayon, Poff would always be the first one to run to the huddle because he'd want to make sure he <laughs> yeah. heard to be like I need to know the call before. Like, and he'd be watching the lips to make sure he got what was happening. Yeah. Just a very quick one before we let you go. Um obviously 25th World Cup game, Namibia haven't won one yet. This could be the one. But yes. I, let's hope so. But I'm guessing you'll be 100% focused on this game. Obviously, we know how special it is for you in particular, but the whole of the Namibian squad, a lot of them or quite a few will have played in France. But there must be a massive ring around the Uruguay game in Lyon since the draw was made, really, because that could be a huge chance to get a first ever World Cup win. Yeah, definitely. I think... Um even though they had a great game against uh, France, we played against them just before the World Cup and we lost, I can't remember, I mean, four or six points or it was a close game we played in Montevideo. Um, We didn't play good. They didn't play the best rugby as well. So I think we are starting measuring each other up. Um, And obviously, when you look at our first three fixtures, we don't want to lose, but we are trying to win. But well, we're not going to tell you less than you 100% that we're going to win this game. Uh, we're going to try our best. And if you look at the ra- rankings and everything, then obviously a bookie's choice would be Uruguay. And that is fortunate for us that we play them last because then, as I said, we can tick the boxes that we know we need before moving back. It's going to be a hell of a game, that Johnny. I know uh, obviously people can look at the big teams or whatever, but that game, I don't know, like obviously Poff will have targeted it for a, a mile out, but it's those games that I look forward to at World Cups as well. 100%. And I'm definitely going to get a few euros on that game now. Poff, first try scorer, <laughs> captain, <laughs> chip kicks, and a first win for Namibia. No, it's cool. And look, I've al- almost taken more pleasure from watching the Tier 2 Nations. So from watching Chile against Samoa, string together some awesome pieces of play, Uruguay, Namibia in fits and starts. Really looking forward to this weekend. But the tier one, a lot of it is now, like if you're watching England, I'm like, I don't want to watch England, the way they're playing rugby. 
I would rather watch the tier two nations that are giving it a go. I preferred watching Japan, who aren't tier two, but I preferred watching Japan trying against England. And that's the same, Namibia, Uruguay, Chile. I've yeah. loved watching them all. So looking forward to that one. That's going to be a big like cross on my calendar. I'm going to sit down and watch that game. Um, and hopefully, Poff, that'll be your first World Cup win, which would be very, very cool. Oh, it'll be quite cool. The weekend, oh, no, tomorrow. Thursday is our first win, mate. Against France. And I'll catch yeah, you for a, I'll catch you for a beer. Not a beer, sorry. I'll catch you I for a coffee. Against France, I don't think there will be Uruguay game. All the boys will be. That'll be it. <laughs> be just yeah, like, there will be nobody left. Whether it is the France game or the Uruguay game, we have all seen the Felipe Contepomi celebration where he scores a try, runs up, sits in the crowd. I'm looking forward to the path, chip and chase, touch it down, go and sit there, get a beer, never to be seen on a rugby field again. Right. If, uh, I will give it to you one on If I score the winning try Thursday night, I will jump over, I will keep running. I will run and I will just keep running. You can find me somewhere in the in a pub somewhere. You pick Johnny out in the crowd and go sit next to him. Oh. Oh, if that happens, no. Johnny starts running before, you know. He exactly, was... <laughs> yeah. I'll be running to join Poff in that bar. I don't want to watch the rest yeah. of the game. I'm gone. Poff, amazing to have you on. Brilliant to hear from you. And a massive good luck against France and Uruguay. Oh, thank you very much. Cheers, Poffy. Bye, boys. You obviously know him very well, Johnny, but lovely guy, Poff. Great guy. Um, One of the best. And actually, you kind of have timings through professional rugby that just kind of work. So we, we arrived at Bayonne. Poff and I played the same position, so we play six, six and eight together. Um, and the wife's got on like a house on fire. The kids were all born at the same time. So it's just one of those, you come together and you meet people. You've got a bloke from Scotland. You've got a bloke from Namibia, the other side of the world, in the south of France, um, having the time of their lives together. So one of the best um, blokes that I've met through rugby. Um, great family, great people. Um, and delighted to see him getting to finish off his career on the biggest stage here in France with his family on the field as well, which will be even more special. So really lovely boy. You mentioned playing the same position. Poff transitioned into the second row there. You didn't fancy that? What? He's heavy, mate. This is the th He's a freak. Like, obviously, you just see scrum cap and beard, but he's a, f he's a freak of nature. And he's 100 and... F like, he didn't really do weights. Didn't really do weights when we were, like, at Bayonne together, playing together. I was only ever 106, 107 maximum kilograms. He was 115, 116. Didn't even eat breakfast. Ate two meals a day. Um, and he had like 10 kegs on me. He's just honestly a freak of nature. Um, and again, one of those players that if he'd come into it earlier, I think he'd have been wider known. But like he lit up the top 14. Playing for Bayonne when we weren't good. He'd break tackles. He was smashing people. Breaking the line with ease. Um, he's just one of those people that just physically a bit of an anomaly. Um and a great guy with it, like absolutely lovely bloke. Right, we'll have a little bit of a chat about France and look ahead to the next set of games after this, but we should find out what your meter moment of the week is, Johnny. It was quite close to giving it to Uruguay. Um, mm. We talked a little bit about that game, but France were disastrous in every single area of the game, um, which will be a big wake-up call for them. Um, Uruguay, loads of heart, simple game plan, hard carry, backs of passion exactly what you want at a World Cup. So it was close to going for them, but I've gone for Fiji, mate. Um, yes. We talked about them pre-tournament, now really strong chance of getting through to the quarters. Um, the performance against the Wallabies, who were abject as well, like they are playing terrible rugby. And, and Fiji now, yes, they have the Botias, they have the two Sovas, they have the try-making ability, the tackle crunching, the go forward, the physicality, but they're also really well organized. Like their kicking game, superb, their box kicking, their X thing, their scrum stands up, their line out stands up. So just all these little bits come together and then it allows them to flourish with these classy bits of play that we all love watching. So Fiji um, beating Australia, which must have left Eddie Jones. I, I don't know what he's thinking at the minute. A, from selection, the people he's left at home, what they're trying to do in terms of a game plan, I've got no idea. I've got no understand how they're trying to play. Um, but Fiji were outstanding. Take nothing away from them. So Fiji are our meter moment of the week. And properly emotional as well. But what do we need to get them in the rugby championship? I mean, we chatted to Puff about what certain countries need. Surely they have to be in the rugby championship. It comes down to the stakeholders. So like Sanzar are going to have to bring them in. Like Fiji can't buy their way in. 
um, it's not going to happen. Um, but it's whether it's Sands are invite them in and then the financials, what does that mechanism look like? Or is it a separate competition? Is there something else that we create, that we facilitate? And again, we talked about the tier two. Fiji are no, now no longer tier two. So how do you create some sort of vehicle or some sort of competition where you have tier two nations getting regular game time against tier one or the chance to earn up or to level up through the tier two comp and play through promotion and relegation tier one nations regularly. That is what everyone is crying out for. That's what the World Cups kind of show is required because despite the fact you have absolute gulfs in countries with professional rugby and professional leagues and big competitions, amateurs are running them close. Uruguay case in point. So um, they absolutely are deserving of better competitions to stimulate their growth and facilitate regular game time against perceived better nations. Um, and that's what you look at Samoa, Tonga, Fiji. That's what they absolutely need as well. Americas, um, Uruguay, America, Canada, they all need it. So there has to be something created fairly soon. There we go. That was Johnny's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 20 million cooks better. Their game changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan. And you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, you can get 10% off any full price item. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD10 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD10, and you get 10% off any full price item at meter.com. We chatted a bit about the France Namibia game with Poff and a little bit about the France Uruguay game. Obviously, I assume Fabian will probably have just parked that Uruguay game now, but I mean, it didn't go well for them. And we mentioned it to Poff. Full noise, Cyril buyback, yeah. Jonathan Dumpty back. Good luck, Poff. Uh, Cyril buyback in is the big news. Greg Aldrich has actually been last out last minute with a knee knock. So fingers crossed his knee, the swelling comes down, that it's nothing serious. It's just a little hyperextension. Um, so the back row is cross Olive Angel Lange. The other news, I guess, back row wise is they haven't kept Makalu, who was probably one of the only decent performers against Uruguay. They've gone with Boudon again. Dante comes back in at 12. The other one in the back line is Gabin Villiers losing his place. So if you're thinking this is now the first choice team and people given the chance to move up and down given form, Louis Biai Barry, who we mentioned for an absolute freak show, has been performing really well, total athlete. It looks like he's taken the spot of Gabin Villiers. So this is full noise. This is full strength. Um, and it isn't going to be easy for Namibia. And the I won't ask you for a prediction on that. Poth might pull you up on it when he meets you for a coffee if you if you if you call it too big in France's favour. But most people looking at that game will obviously now having seen the team sheet be predicting a big France win and a big backlash. I am predicting Poth to score a last minute try. Probably a bit of a consolation, but <laughs> if Poth gets on the score on the score sheet, that would be superb. But yeah, look the way the two teams are playing. The gulf is clear. Um, but we said France should run out comfortably. It's a question of how big a gap against Uruguay. And then look looked like I was talking absolute nonsense because France is really poor. So if France apply themselves mentally, they're switched on and they control the game, it should be comfortable. But, you know, the Namibians, Poff, Torsten, the players that we know, with the coaching staff, they'll have a few plans to try and make it as difficult as possible for the French side. But yeah, you'd expect France to be comfortable winners. There are a couple of absolutely massive games this weekend, but we were chatting to Poff about it. That Namibia-Uruguay game is a is one that I think everyone should be looking forward to. Georgia-Portugal this weekend as well. That could be a good one. Yeah, it could be another cracker. Um, and, and the cool thing about these games is you're looking forward to seeing who can control possession and actually who's got what in the tank. How well are they organised? Because a lot of what we see is passion, um, determination, you know, banging collisions on a gain line. But then what we want to see is what of these teams also got ball in hand. Portugal played some really nice stuff, ball in hand. Um, the try they scored as well from a set piece against Wales, sleight of hand, it was Dabi Gerard, the old coach from Toulouse, who's the French coach. That's straight off the training ground. So they've got these little creative elements that are working, but I just want to see more of both sides. Georgia didn't really fire a shot against the Wallabies in the opening game. Um, and, and Portugal looked decent. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that one pans out and it's actually quite even 
um, from what I've seen on both sides. Um, but that could be a, a huge win. The, the other thing to note at this stage as well is, with sides losing a first couple of games, if you finish third in your pool, you assure qualification for the next World Cup. So each and yeah. every one of these games, they might seem, some people outwardly might be the other bit meaningless between two nations that these are absolutely huge. Like Georgia, Portugal for these two countries is absolutely massive because it means you don't have to go through qualification, through regionals for the next competition in Australia. You go straight in. So that'll be a, a huge clash for Georgia and Portugal. And that might be the case for Scotland as well, Johnny. It's the exact same principle. Um, so speaking to Big Ben Tamifuna about that as well, for Tonga, they knew they had to knock over one of South Africa, Ireland or Scotland to finish third. Um, and Scotland the same. If they, if they lose this game, the likelihood is that they finish fourth and they don't qualify automatically for the next World Cup. So Scotland, after being absolutely cuffed <clears throat> in their opener against South Africa, be a very different proposition against Tonga. Um, I don't expect Tonga to be as poor as they were against Ireland. Um, actually, if you pulled apart the nuts and bolts of how they played, like defensively and physically, Ireland actually struggled because the Tongans are f so physical on that game line. So it's going to be a real battle again for Scotland to try and stretch and bend that Tonga defensive line and create space. Um, Tonga were really indisciplined and gave away loads of penalties, loads of field position against the Irish. They can't do that against Scotland. Um, but I expect that to be a much tighter affair in that Ireland already had a game under their belts when they played Tonga. Tonga, that was their first hit out, um, which is always difficult to compete after two weeks with, of no prep. Um, so I expect that game to be much tighter. Um, but my hope still is that Scotland have enough in the tank and there's enough on the line that they will win that game. And then a massive game on Saturday night, Ireland, South yeah. Africa. <laughs> Very tough to call, but which way do you see it going? I honestly have no idea. Um, it could go either way. I, I don't know what the conditions are like this weekend. That could also play a massive part in deciding. But you've got two teams with such contrasting styles. Ireland that love to play ball in hand, extremely well organised, diligent, comfortable on ball. But against probably the best defence in the competition. Um, a really high blitz defence, which is unusual to play against. So you don't have <clears throat> the ability to keep going out the back door the way that Ireland do a lot, they have sort of screen plays and they tip out the back. But if you do that against South Africa and you get caught once or twice, you're 20 metres behind the gain line. So I expect them to actually keep the ball much closer to the gain line, play to front runners, try and get, go forward and then earn their way wide, um, which is not something we see against Ireland. They sort of use those screeners and, and they go go wide quite quickly. Um, and they really try to stretch Tonga, but I, I don't think they'll have that space and time against South Africa. Um and then you've just got the kicking game, which is absolutely huge. We saw South Africa, what they did to Scotland, going to the air, punishing their back three, and then playing off scraps, but some really, really powerful rugby. They are some of the best in the world. Big athletes come around the corner that you have to stop. So I don't know, honestly, um, but I'm really, that's the game. There's probably two games that I'm most looking forward to from this weekend. Uh, Ireland, South Africa, which dictates probably how that pool is going to finish and who plays against either France and New Zealand um, come the quarterfinals. Um, and that will be a you know a huge test match. The other one, which is absolutely huge, Australia, who lost to Fiji, have another chance against Wales. But Australia and Wales, it's really a case of who can be less bad. That sounds really bad. That, that's come out of my mouth. But it's two sides that don't look comfortable, don't look settled, don't look like they have a way of playing. Um, it's been really scrappy. And I think that would be a really scrappy game in that it's quite horrible to say that, but who can be less bad? Um, but whoever is less bad in that game, Australia still have a shot of staying in the quarters and Wales, if they win that one, they they march straight through. So everything on the line, knockout rugby um, and another huge test match at the World Cup. Just quickly on South Africa, one of your areas of expertise, the line out, obviously it's pretty surprising to see Andre Pollard a fly half called up for the injured Malcolm Marks, especially when you consider he's one of only two specialist hookers that they named in their initial squad. If you got Dion Ferry, who spent most of his career as a hooker before he went to France and then transitioned at Leon into the back row, but he hasn't played there properly for five years. You've got Marco Van Staden, who's been training. Uh, hooker was given a bit of time in the last game there, and they've named him on recent team sheets as someone who can fill in there but that's a massive call isn't it and particularly when you consider that Umbanambi obviously has been starting loads of games for them 
a brilliant player, but not as good in the line out as Malcolm Marks. And what you're also saying by not bringing another hooker in is that Mbanambi is going to have to start the whole way through the competition. So the fact that you're not bringing somebody else in as backup and you're going Fury on the bench, who, as we said, is was a hooker, but then spent time in the top 14 as a back rower. Um, it's the one question mark I have of Razi Erasmus. Like, I'm a big fan of the way he operates, the fact that he's a player that can play in a multitude of different positions. That bit scares me a little bit, that he's only got two hookers, but then he obviously has a certain level of faith or confidence that Dion Fury can step up and start Test Match Rugby and be excellent because I don't think Razi is the type of bloke to take risks. I don't think this is a, he would over calculate. He'd be like, no, like South African rugby and Springbok rugby is huge. He's the head of it. And I think he knows what's best. So it's a big statement, but Umbanambi now essentially has to start against Ireland. Um, He's already started against, or he already played against Scotland, came off the bench, but it's now a big task for Dion Fury. How much game time does he get? Which games does he start? And then are you backing up an to start the whole way through the knockouts? That's also a, a huge ask. There's nobody else to bring out at all when they've got they've got three or four blokes that they could bring back out from the URC um, that are super pookers. So it's a weird one, but then Rassi seems to have a track record of doing the best thing and coming out on top. So you must be right. You gave it the big billing, Johnny. Australia, Wales. Very different type of game for Eddie Jones in Australia. Obviously, Wales are in a more comfortable position, but you mentioned it. They lose it and, you know, they could find themselves out of the pool stages still. Very easily. Um, and added to the fact that Australia have been poor. You can't get away from the fact they've been poor. This now adds massive pressure to this game and they've been poor. So how does that affect them mentally? Is that going to are they going to be even worse in their performance, which they kind of struggle to be? Is that really harsh? That might be a little bit harsh. Um, but they just look completely aimless and toothless, and they don't know what they're doing. They don't really have a way of playing. They lost Will Skelton before the game. Tupo's been out. Alan Artua got injured during the warm-up, so they had to have... It was Slipper that had to slip in a tight head for them, and he didn't look comfortable there at all. So they've had big players out through injury, but even with ball in hand, they've just looked lost. So... It's not that Wales have been outstanding, don't get me wrong. Um, I genuinely think this game is going to be who can be less poor. But then that might come back to the simple things we talked about, you know, passion, working hard at a game line, collisions, contact, keeping your head discipline-wise, all very simple. But it doesn't really seem that they're going to out-rugby each other because they're not playing outstanding rugby, if that makes sense. So a uh, huge pressure game all on the line. And, and, and the Wallabies could very, very easily miss out on knockout rugby at the World Cup for the first time in, I can't remember. Must um, be ever, surely. But a very realistic possibility. Um, through their injuries, the way they're playing, the way they're organised, they they haven't looked great. Um, neither of Wales, but you'd say Wales with two wins under their belt will be going to this game more confident. Um, and yeah, they probably back themselves to nick it against the Australian side that's depleted. Thanks, Johnny. A massive thanks to Puff for joining us as well. Big thanks to all you guys for listening. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass and on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Johnny. Cheers, Tim. Bye. Bye.